Good morning. It is good to be here. When I was asked to, to come and bring the message here in Slave Lake, I was excited. I have had not a chance to be uh, amongst you at, at this point yet, and it's been a wish of mine to go and to visit the other churches in, in, outside of the Crete. And for those who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Darren Froese. I'm one of the elders at Countryside Community Church. Um, recently, this past summer, I also accepted a position as the church administrator for the church there as well, uh, which basically means dealing with lots of the communication pieces of, between the leadership table and the rest of the congregation to um, help bridge that gap a little bit. Um, I am a father of four children. We have our families here today. We have three boys and a girl. And it's been an adventure being in ministry uh, with a young family, as many others can probably attest to as well, as you want to make sure that the children are, are listening well, but also having that balance of what's, re- what's realistic. Um, previously to um, my role in the church, I, I was a teacher in the school system for a number of years, as well as before that, I was a director of Pine Lodge Bible Camp in La Crete as well, and so... Uh, I've, I've been blessed to be able to uh, see God work in a w- variety of different places and settings, and, and right now we are in a, in a space where we are continuing to serve, and we're excited to see where he'll lead next, because my thoughts and prayers have always been for, in my life to, if God opens the door, and if it seems clear his direction, to say yes and to jump through. Um, and he has given me um, many blessings through that, and I hope I can continue to be faithful in that. So this morning when I was, I asked Billy last week, I said, so are you going through any passages? Are you going through any series, anything, any starting point? And he gave the answer that I don't really like hearing a whole lot. It says, it's whatever's on your heart. And then you have to think through, okay, what should I speak on? What, what, because I, I don't know these people. I don't know what they need. I don't know where, uh, I don't know what, the, what, what kind of thing that the Lord is, is, is wanting them to, to understand. And all through the week, we had VBS this week. And during VBS, um, they're talking about two kingdoms in VBS, talking about the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven, and how um, God wants them to be part of the kingdom of heaven, and how this world is an enemy, how he wants them to not be part of that kingdom. They want to deceive them and, and cause them to, to fall away. And one of the songs that the, the children sang was <clears throat> based on John 14, 6, which was, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And even my, my one-year-old was singing all throughout this past few weeks, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. So that when you have a one-year-old on repeat singing those words, they kind of go into your mind. And so that's what I decided to speak on this morning. And when he pulled up to the church, we, we pulled up on the side of the church. I'm like, oh, they know it already. It's on the side of their building. And so I hope if nothing else, this is a reminder of, of that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So... This morning, if you want to turn to John 14, we'll start in verse 1, and we'll go up to verse 11. <clears throat> John 14, starting verse 1, we read, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us a father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the words. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So going back to the first verse there, we read, let not your hearts be troubled. So obviously, prior to this chapter, the disciples' hearts were troubled, 
or else he would not be giving them a command not to have their hearts troubled. So to go to the previous chapter, in chapter 13, we look to see here what was causing them to be troubled. Why were their hearts troubled? And if we start in verse 31, we read of, of Jesus announcing to his disciples that he'll be leaving them. In verse 31, it says, so, he had gone, so when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will see me, and then, as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this you will know that, that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. So just to get a mental picture in our mind, these disciples for the past three years are following Jesus around in ministry, seeing him do miracles, seeing and hearing teachings that was very, very contrary to anything they'd ever heard before. They were all used to the Jewish system of the law, following the law. They knew what to do, what not to do. And Jesus comes alongside and teaches things that were very, very radical in that time. And they trusted him with their whole life. They, they left everything. They dropped their nets and they followed him. And now in, in chapter 13, <clears throat> he's telling them, I'm, I'm going to be leaving you guys. I, I'm, I'm, I'll be here for a little bit longer and then I'll be gone. So putting yourself in the disciples' shoes, I think I'd be a bit, a bit distraught as well because you, you've left everything to follow this, this man who you believe to be Messiah, who, who, who you believe to be as God, and now he's going to be leaving you. They don't have that full picture. As, as, as we are blessed to have the whole copy of the Bible where we can read through to the end of John and we can read through, yes, he died on the cross, but he rose victorious and ascended to heaven. We know the whole story. They didn't have that story. They, they couldn't go and look forward in history and see, oh, I, I get it now. They were still thinking, why are you leaving us? And so he's telling them in chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he tells them why their hearts shouldn't be troubled. In verse 2 he says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he brings comfort saying, yes, I'm leaving, but I'm doing it for a purpose. The reason that I'm leaving is to go prepare a place for you. And, if, and, and in my father's house are many mansions, he's, and he's telling him, I would not lie to you. If this wasn't so, I wouldn't have said it. You can trust me, he's saying. And when it's ready, he's going to come back and receive him to himself. And this is for us as well as a church. Jesus is preparing a place for us, for all those who believe in him and have followed, are repented of their sins and have accepted the free gift of salvation. He is pre preparing a place for us that we may be with him forever. And reading this made me ask myself, how much does my life reflect that I'm living knowing this? Knowing that Jesus is in heaven right now preparing a place for us and that he is coming back in his time. And we see more and more signs day after day that he is coming back for his children. Or how often do we get distracted by, by things of this world, by, by work, by the, necessities, the necessary things we have to do to live, but yet... He has that promise that doesn't change, that he is coming back for all those who, who follow him. Or how much are we investing into, into things of this world? And then going to verse 4, he gives a statement that really confuses the disciples. So, again, context. He says in chapter 13, he's leaving them. First part of chapter 14, he says, uh, don't, be, don't be afraid. Next part, he says, I'm, going, I'm leaving to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back. So the disciples are getting some peace. And then in verse 4 he says, and where, you, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Hearing this just confuses the disciples, telling them that they know where he's going, and they know the way he's going. We know this confuses them, because in verse 5, Thomas speaks up and says, Lord, 
we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And so Thomas, he's speaking his mind, he's thinking, well, I want to go where you are, Jesus. I want, I want to be there, and, and I want to go, but did I miss something? Did, did you tell us the way? Did you tell us the location? He, he's thinking roadmap. He's thinking, okay, do I have to make a left at Damascus or a right at Damascus? How do I know the way? Where, where are you going that, that I should know where it is? And often for us as well, we face situations where we feel lost and confused about what our next steps in life are or how to respond in certain situations, and we can feel just as lost as Thomas. And Jesus brings clarity in verse 6. He says, okay, it's not, it's not a road map. He says in verse 6, and Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He declares that he is that way. He is the truth and he is the life. And no one comes to the Father. No one's going to go to where he is except through him. He is the way in which they should follow to the Father. And this morning we're going to look into those three aspects, being the way, the truth, and the life, and, and go through scripture and see different parts where it talks about that and, and how that's different of what the world says is the way, what the world says is the truth, and the world says is life. And the response that Jesus gives seems to fit the answer that Thomas was looking for. Thomas said that he did not know where Jesus was going and the way to go, and Jesus told them that he was the way. But can be asked, how can a man be a path or a route to somewhere? In the eyes of the world, this is foolishness. You need GPS or you need, I know I, I had, this is the, the Crete in me, I had to put in my, the place where we were staying in Big Fish Bay and to see where we're getting back. I, I didn't know the way to which left to take, and sometimes I need my, my GPS to know the way to go. But this isn't that kind of road map. Uh, in the eyes of the world, there are many paths that can lead not only physically, but in the world's eyes, for eternal life, the world will say there's many paths that can lead to eternal life. If you just do enough good works, or if you say enough prayers, or if you do this, or if you do that, or if you, if you're, if you can maybe be good enough, then, then maybe you can have eternal life, is what they would say. Well, one commentary I found writes this, it says, Thomas's question assumes the normal pattern of human accomplishment. We determine the end goal and work accordingly. But salvation cannot be accomplished by good works. Our sinful natures make it impossible to behave in a way that reconciles us to God. Jesus did not tell the disciples they, didn't, they knew the destination. In fact, he said he would, come to get them. he would come to get them. But they know the way there. This is true because the means of salvation is not a process. It's a person. It is through and only through the person of Christ. We cannot strive to earn heaven. We can only seek to follow Christ. That is how we are meant to know God. And there's other passages also confirm that Jesus is the only way. If we go to John chapter 10, reading verse 9, Jesus is, is, is teaching about being the good shepherd. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and come out and find pasture. Paul also writes about this in, in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 verses 1 and 2, we read, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Through Jesus, we have access by faith. He is that way to, to, to get to, to the Father. Also looking in, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, reading verses 19 and 20. We read, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which is concentrated for us through the veil that is the flesh. There we read about the impact that Jesus' blood, that Jesus being the way has for the Father of Jesus. By Jesus' blood, his finished work on the cross, we have access to God. 
And the reference there is talking about the old system where in, in the temple, in the tabernacle, they had to have a veil, a thick veil, separating man from God, where they could only go once per year if they were, if they were ceremonially cleaned. But through Jesus dying on the cross, that veil was torn, where we have full access to God, coming to him in, in, in repentance and humility. And it is through relationship with Jesus, through knowing his word and obeying his word, being filled with his spirit and walking in obedience, that we can know the way. The next part of Jesus' claim is that he is the truth. So what does he mean that he is the truth? In today's culture, truth is not recognized as a, something that can be known and is accepted as something that can be relative as, instead of absolute. If something is true for one person is, but not true for another, it is acceptable in many areas. This can be very dangerous in that there is no absolute truth in the lines of what is morally right and morally wrong, which can become very, very blurred. If we do not want to face a standard of truth, we can just seek out a different truth to make things easier for ourselves. In the past few, few years, it's been really clear that if you don't like the truth about, about things you see in the news, you just turn on another channel and see someone else's news, or go to this feed and see their truth, and go to this feed and see their truth. Truth is, is very relative in the eyes of the world. If you don't like it, you just find someone else. That's not what's true for God. And this is actually accounted in, in a story in uh, 2 Chronicles. If you turn there, it's similar to the passage that was read uh, this morning as well, but it's another instance of, of a, a king not really being a fan of a prophet. And so we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. <clears throat> we'll read the first 17 verses. It's a, a story of Micaiah and Ahab. And so just a context here, Jehoshaphat was planning on going to war and, and partnering with Ahab to, to go in, into battle. And there, Jehoshaphat was hoping to seek some inquiries of, of, from the Lord to see if it was the right thing to do. So it says, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance, and, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab. After some years he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with him, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, and my people are as your people. We will be with you in the war. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire of the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So they all said, Go up, for God de will deliver you into the, ha into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still another prophet of the Lord here, that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such, such things. And the king said, The king of Israel called one of his officers and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imla, quickly. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, and the king, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, clothed in their robes and each sat on their throne and sat at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Shaniah and had made horns of iron for himself and said, Thus says the Lord, with these shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the message, messenger who had gone to, to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophet, with one accord according to the king. Therefore, please let your words be like the, like the word of the of the one of them, and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever, the, whatever my God says, I will speak. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to the war against Ram Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he said, Go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then he said, 
I saw all Israel scattered on the mountain as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let, them, let each return to their house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prosper like good concerning me but evil? We'll stop there for, for now. But in that story, Ahab did not want to hear from Micaiah. He did not want to accept the truth. So he had all these prophets that he knew would just say whatever he wanted them to say and that he would be able to get the answer he was looking for. But he knew that Micaiah would speak the truth of the Lord. He knew that he would. He knew even amongst pressure, he might give in a little bit, but when, when being asked, he would say the truth. And regardless of the truth of God was unchanged. Later in the chapter, the prophecy came true and Ahab was killed in battle. The world does not recognize the need for truth. And we of ourselves try everywhere possible to get out of truth. You think of the court system. When someone has to testify in court, they have to, they have to make a vow. They have to vow to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And you think, well, why so much detail? Well, if, the, if they just had to tell the truth and the other parts weren't there, they could say the truth, but maybe leave something out. That's not the whole truth. They could say the truth and add something onto it as well. That's the truth, but something more than the truth. And still not the truth. Even the world system recognizes that of ourselves, we are known not to gravitate towards truth. This is not how the truth of God works. Truth is only found in one source, and from God alone. In Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, he said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Also, you read of the benefits of knowing the truth that we read in, in John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. Flipping back to John. John 8, starting in verse 31. We'll read a few verses there. It says, And Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word... You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set, shall set you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we'll be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whomever commits sin is a slave to sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Knowing Jesus as truth, knowing him as the only source of truth for everything that we need, gives freedom. Freedom from the falsehoods of this world. Jesus being the truth means that we have this revelation of God. We can know the truth of God through knowing Jesus. Jesus knowing Jesus as the way, knowing that he is the path, he is the way, the, the route, the access point to God. Knowing Jesus as truth means that he is giving us the knowledge of who he is, the truth of who he is. And finally this morning we'll look at him being the life. The final statement Jesus makes is that he is the life. That not, not, only, a way to, not only the way to, of eternal life to the Father, but also the source of life for us. And a few years ago, this is in probably my teen and college years, maybe it's still a saying today, but the term YOLO was really popular, meaning you only live once. And this was used to ex as an excuse to give in to decisions that were often reckless and meant to, to be a thrill. It was a mindset, well, we only have one life to live, so let's live it to the fullest as we are in full control, was the mindset of that saying. And Jesus is saying the opposite. He is, he is the life. Our life our true life can be found only in Him. Going back to John chapter 10, we reading verse 7 and on to verse, verse 10. We'll see some more to the how He is the life. It says, And Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who entered came before me, and thieves and robbers, but, sheep, but my sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and in and, from, and in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill 
and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus, not only is he the door, the path that leads to the Father, but the purpose of him coming was that we might have life, abundant life, not life found in ourselves, but life given through him. So what does this life look like? It is walking in the Spirit and bearing fruit, as we read about in Galatians. It is having victory over sin. In this life, we will have struggles, we will have shortcomings. We are still in our flesh. We are, we're, we're continually being made new, but we're still not completely glorified until we are with Him, with the Father. But having this life means that we, can, we do not have to stay there. We have access to abundant life that is far better than anything in this world. Going back to John 14. The last part of verse 6 says, No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is making abundantly clear. He's not making any guesswork for us. It's not, there's no way of going around it or over it. He's not saying, well, maybe some people. He's not saying, maybe that person or maybe this group of people. He's saying, no one comes to the Father except through him. He is the only way to have access to where he is going. And he is, and, and not of good works, not rituals, not wealth, not good life. Jesus alone is the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. He's the only way to get to God the Father. So if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, how do we get a hold of it? And Jesus answers as we continue in, in John 14 and reading in verse 7. We read, If ye had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. And again, that brings confusion to Philip, and he asks, Lord, show us a Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and yet ye have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sakes of the sake of the works themselves. And so another disciple of Philip is still confused and asked him to show the Father. And you can kind of hear Jesus' frustration. And he says, Have I been with you so long? that you still don't know me, Philip. In, in today's world, it'd be like, spending, as, as a teacher, be me teaching a student a math lesson and thinking, yep, they got it, they got it. And then asking the question, and just something completely out of nowhere comes out. And then I would look at them, have I not taught you math for so long that you still don't get it? It's right here. It's obvious. I've made it so clear to you. That I, and Jesus is saying, have you not known that I, that I and my Father are one? Have I not spent enough time with you for you to recognize who I am? And for us this morning too, maybe in our life, are we spending enough time with God through knowing His Word? Are we spending enough time in His Word to know God? Because if you're looking for any other point or any other access point to know who God is other than God's word, you're looking in the wrong spot. God's word is his, his truth to us knowing of, of, of knowing of who he is. And he's telling you, have I not taught you, have I not spent time with you that you should know this? He and the Father are one. The way, the way of getting access to the Father is through relationship with Jesus, through knowing who he is, through seeing what he's done for us, for accepting his free gift of salvation, of him dying on the cross, through understanding the promises he's given and instructions that he gives in his word to walk in the Spirit. If we were to continue on in the chapter, we, he talks about him leaving the Spirit to guide us back to all truth. That's the purpose of the Spirit. Jesus, in physical form, is not with us 
on this earth anymore. Like I said, he's in heaven preparing a place for us, but he does not leave us as orphans. He leaves his spirit here to guide us back to truth that's found in his word. And when we repent of our sins, when we ask for forgiveness of our sins, when we receive the free gift of salvation, his Holy Spirit comes and indwells us for that purpose. You may, maybe this morning you're asking, well, how can we know him? How can, I, how can I know him as my Savior? How can I know him as, as, as a way of knowing God? Because he is God. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, a very common passage. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God desires us for us to know that it is nothing we do. It is only by through Jesus and by the gift of grace given to us by him that we can be saved. Once we have this realization of Jesus is the only way that leads to us to have confession and repentance of sin. Another common passage is 1 John 1, 9 that says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is just agreeing with God what he has done, that what we have done is wrong. Repentance, then, is more than saying we're sorry. Repentance is going and turning completely around and walking away from that sin. And as we grow in our Christian walk, and as we learn to walk in the Spirit, we will continue to become more like him and continue to bear fruit. We can't expect to have everything right away. Here we go. We're going to, our life's going to be completely different. It's a sanctifying process of continually growing into who God created us to be. Continually surrendering things in our life, saying no to sin and saying yes to Christ, knowing that he is the only way. And maybe this morning you... Maybe you're new here, or maybe you, you, you've been here for a long time, and, you, and you've heard the message of salvation. You've heard Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And maybe this morning it's, it's making more sense, and, and, you, and you're not sure if you have a relationship with God. You're not sure if you, if you know the way, if you know the truth, and you know the life. There's a wonderful team of ministerial here who would love to talk to you, would love to pray with you, and to, to show you who Jesus is and how he can get, lead you to the only source of truth and the giver of abundant life. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are the way, that you are the truth, and you are the life. Lord, we thank you for this church, for the ministerial team here that loves on their people, and that they love you. And Lord, I pray for this church. Lord, if there's people here who are not sure where they stand in relationship with you, that you would stir their hearts, that they would desire to know you and get confirmation that they know you as Savior, and that they know that you, are the, that you are the way, that you are the truth, and you're the life. And for those who have made that choice long ago, but Lord, maybe they haven't been committed to reading your word. Maybe they haven't been committed to, to knowing more about who you are through studying your word. Lord, I pray that you would prompt them, that you would guide them back to your word, that they would know that it is the only source of truth and that we can anticipate you coming back. Lord, thank you that you are preparing a place for us. And Lord, help us to be ready for when you return. Help us to be ready and excited to tell others not to be selfish for salvation, Lord God, that we would, as your word says in Matthew, to go out and tell the nations, to make disciples of all nations, Lord God, that we would not hold this wonderful gift for ourselves, that we would share it with others. I thank you for the opportunity to share here, Lord God, and I pray that you continue to, to bless our day. In Jesus' name, amen.